As a criminal psychologist, I've heard it all. Virtually any outrageous reason you can think of for why someone committed the crime they did, I've heard it. Now, when I say I believe someone who told a preposterous story, it's because I do believe that is the reason they did it. Due to whatever mental illness they might suffer from, there's times I believe them when they say a leprechaun told them to kill their neighbor. Obviously, I don't believe an actual leprechaun manifested itself to this person and that they actually only did what they did because they are crazy. But in my line of work, you have to talk to a person as if what they were hallucinating about actually happened. This case was different though. I think I believe his story and not because he thinks that's what happened but because I've had a feeling for a long time he was not suffering from any mental affliction and might actually have been telling the truth. I'm going to post our interview here. There will of course be some redacted information, names were changed, and I've cut out a lot of my trivial interjections in the interest of flow and pacing. I'll leave it up to you to decide if he's crazy. A little about him before we start. He was a PhD educated professor of biology. He was a PhD educated professor of biology, anatomy, and pathology, and serves as the chairman of the biology department at the local university. He had no personal or familial history of any kind of mental illness. Please introduce yourself and why you're here. Uh, my name is Michael, and uh, I shot my friends Dave and Gary right outside our personal science lab at the docks near Marina. Start from the beginning. It all started a few days ago when the school year concluded. We were taking our annual camping trip to celebrate the end of exams. It was me, Dave, Gary, and John, all fellow biology department professors. We go to Provincial Park in Canada every year. We spend a few days at a campground and then go to a deep woods wilderness campsite that we have to use our canoes to get to. That's our favorite part the deep woods. There's never anybody there and we're all alone. The vacation went well at first. Once we found a nice site in the back of the woods, that started off great too. I'm scuba certified and we'd never been to this part of the lake before. We were more backwoods than we'd ever been. I was eager to dive here. How's the visibility? Most lakes I've heard like this, the visibility isn't great or there's nothing to see. True, there's not much to see. It's the same kind of fish you can see in a city park pond, but there's something about diving into a body of water that few people ever touch. It's mostly unsullied by people's garbage and whatnot. Tell me what you saw down there. I didn't dive in until our second day. It was very uneventful, but part of the enjoyment for me, like I said, was being 30 feet down and not seeing any trash or anything man-made at all. I went out further towards the center of the lake, visibility was low, so I didn't see it right away. It kind of crept up on me. At first, I thought it was a small propeller plane or something, but I, I quickly realized it was too big. It was irregularly shaped for sure, and had a large shaft towards what I figured was the rear of the craft, protruding upwards that had a small fin at the top. The fin was probably about 15 feet or so below the water level. I swam to what I thought was the front of the craft and saw a rounded area sitting atop the otherwise pointed bow. It had a little window that I thought must be the cockpit. The glass was broken and it was impossible to see anything inside. I quickly came to the conclusion, based on the design of this vessel, it did not appear to be any man-made craft of any kind that I had ever seen or heard of and that I was potentially looking at a UFO. I reserved full judgment on whether or not it was a UFO until I got a second opinion. John was also a diver and had brought a tank. I would have him go down with me to investigate further. I really shouldn't have been diving by myself anyway. John was immediately intrigued when I told him I had found an aircraft at the bottom of the lake and it didn't look like anything I would ever seen before. He was ready to go in minutes. We took a canoe out to where I thought it was to save air and we went down. We found it relatively quickly. He did as thorough a swim around as I did. Seeing it again, it was kind of shaped like a large arrowhead. Look up an F-117 Nighthawk. That's kind of what it looked like, though it looked much more alien in design. It wasn't flat underneath. It had a bulkier cargo area or something below. 
John found a large opening in the hull underneath what appeared to be the left wing of the craft. He was ready to enter, but I stopped him. My air was too low and it was getting dark. I motioned for him to meet me at the surface, so we swam back up. I told him I needed to switch to my other tank. Each of us had brought two tanks. If there was any chance of us entering the craft, I also told him it would be much better to wait until morning. We spent that night telling Gary and Dave what we had seen. Gary immediately became paranoid. He was of the mind that since we even knew this craft existed, we were in danger from the government. If we swam into the aircraft and actually found an ET, the pilot, we were as good as dead. We eventually decided we were indeed going in. We toyed with Gary, saying the pilot was probably long gone. He swam out the back, assimilated into human form and probably replaced, and is now living as the Queen of England. We eventually went to bed, but I hardly slept at all. I don't think John did either. The next morning John and I went down again. We approached the hull breach. It was more than large enough for us to fit in one at a time. It's important to note the exterior of the craft was metallic, but it was difficult to say what material. What I found interesting is that the outer hull was completely free of aquatic fungus or algae or even rust. Anything that would indicate it had been there for a while. This led me to believe this may have been a recent crash, and that made me nervous. We secured a rope to the outside of the craft so we could follow it to find our way out if we got turned around at all. Once we got inside, the interior told a different story. The inside was very dilapidated, nowhere near the almost pristine nature of the outer hull. Judging by the aquatic plant life and algae that we could see growing, and the amount of fish that had settled and were darting out of every crevice we swam by, it appeared this vessel had been down here for some time. We appeared to be in some sort of cargo area. There was an open doorway near the back we looked in, and it appeared to be an engine room. We examined what we believed to be the engine, but rubble and pillars had fallen and it blocked our access to the greater part of the area. We proceeded down a narrow corridor towards the bow. We swam right and came to a ladder. This ladder went up a few feet and we saw what appeared to be a hatch that was closed. We swam up to examine it. We pushed on it first to no avail and searched around the area until I saw what appeared to be a lever off to the side. I motioned to John and he motioned for me to pull it. I did so and we heard something near the hatch mechanically release, which also released a large amount of air bubbles into the water, but the hatch remained closed. We puzzled it over for a few seconds before John pulled out his diving knife. He attempted to slide it into one of the edges on the right side of the hatch and was able to penetrate a few inches. He worked it for a few minutes and the hatch inched open slightly before the blade snapped. It had opened just enough for us to get our fingers in, so we tried pushing and pulling. There was much resistance, but with our combined efforts, the hatch slowly began to open. We swam up into what could only have been the cockpit. I saw the broken window I had seen from the outside. John swam ahead and around what appeared to be a large chair, probably for the pilot. I heard him let out a muffled cry of extreme surprise, and he swam back towards me faster than I'd ever seen him swim. His mouthpiece had fallen out and he had to put it back in. His eyes were wild. He pointed to the chair and he made back and forth motions with his hands like he was turning a steering wheel. I was slightly confused, but then he pretended he was using a joystick and made muffled sounds with his mouth. I realized he was pretending to fly a plane and the sounds he was making were supposed to be machine guns. I then realized he was trying to tell me the pilot was still sitting in his chair. I motioned for him to calm down. I was afraid as well, but I knew I needed to see this. I motioned to him that I was going to go look for myself. I motioned for him to stay, but he shook his head. I then proceeded to swim slowly around the chair and he followed behind me. Any doubt that this was a UFO was then extinguished. The being sitting in the chair was humanoid, but definitely not human. Its head was about 20% larger than a human's, I'd say, and it was probably about 4 feet tall. Its arms were floating lifelessly in the water and were disproportionately long. I took note immediately about how there appeared to be no rot or skin breakdown of the being despite the length of time the cargo area indicated this craft had been underwater. I knew John and I needed to actually speak, so I motioned for us to retreat. We returned to the surface and discussed our options. After the initial shock, we discussed our next options. The first was to simply leave and not tell anybody, including Gary and Dave, what we had seen. We knew we'd never be able to keep that secret, so that was out. 
We discussed a few more options before I realized what we needed to do. Or I should say, what I badly wanted to do. I told John we needed to get back to our lab we had at the docks and perform an autopsy. He looked at me like I was a complete idiot. He asked how we were actually supposed to get it back to the States. I told him my plan and he said it might just work. We then retrieved the body carefully and loaded it into the canoe. I rowed back to shore while John swam. I don't think he wanted to sit in the boat with the body. Unsurprisingly, Gary and Dave absolutely flipped their shit when we got back. I told them we were leaving right now, going back to the car and driving straight home. They were confused at first, but then John told them what was down there was not only a UFO, but the pilot was in the canoe. Gary turned white as a ghost when he saw it, and Dave was intrigued. I then laid out my plan. We drove an oversized cargo van. There was one bench seat in the back that sat about a foot off the floor so you could put crap underneath it. My plan was to leave the body in the canoe, pack it with ice and cover it up, then put the canoe in the back with us instead of on the roof. It would just fit since the front end would be able to fit underneath the bench seat in the back. We then drove straight to our lab. What kind of lab is this? You just have your own lab? We use it for ourselves. It's rented space in one of the warehouses. We mostly use it to set up lab assignments for students or test new assignments we think of to make sure they are actually viable assignments. Okay, please continue. Gary freaks out and almost loses it. He said if we get randomly searched when crossing the border back to the United States, they'll find the body and we're all as good as black bagged. Dave tells him that as long as everyone shuts up and only the driver talks, we'll be fine. We all argued for about 20 minutes about it before it was settled. We were taking this body back to our lab. We got everything packed up and ended up leaving some things we could replace later since we were in such a hurry. It was a three hour drive, but only one hour to the border. We just had to get across. I would be the driver and would be doing all the talking. Gary was a nervous wreck as we watched cars seemingly at random get beckoned over to a separate drive area to be inspected. He held it together somehow. We crossed over without incident. Gary about had a mental breakdown as we pulled away from the station and were home free. We changed the ice several times, but otherwise the canoe cooler held up. I drove slightly below the speed limit since we certainly didn't need to get pulled over. We got to our lab at about 2.30 in the afternoon. We smuggled the cadaver into the lab and set it up on the table. We locked all the doors and made sure the windows were drawn as well. I realized at this time that we were at the point of no return. We were able to perform an unauthorized autopsy on an alien life form. We had no idea how we were supposed to publish our results or what we were supposed to do when we concluded. We were all likely to get black bagged if it was something the government wanted to keep secret, but we had come this far and there was no way we were going to stop now. We video recorded the entire thing. My initial examination revealed that E.T. did not have a sternum similar to humans. It had two large sternum-like bones on the left and right side of its chest, but its center was soft, making it an easy choice for a first incision. We cut deep in order to open it up. It was fascinating. It appeared to have the same internal organs as we do, just in different spots, of course. It was hard to tell what was what aside from the lungs. We concluded they must be the lungs because they were filled with water, initially indicating the cause of death was drowning. There did not appear to be any trauma anywhere else on the E.T.'s body, so we also concluded it may not have actually crashed as initially thought. While we had it opened up, we labeled all the organs we thought we could. Whether or not it was actually correct, we obviously had no idea, but for the sake of completion, we assigned everything and came to the conclusion the E.T. had a heart, liver, lungs, kidneys, and possibly a spleen. We then moved to its head. Its brain was similar to humans in that it looked similar, and as far as we could tell, consisted of several different lobes, though the main difference was that it appeared to be triangular in shape. As if it were a pyramid sitting within its skull, there was also a small, unknown gland situated near the base of the brain itself. We had initially deduced that the brain stem was already accounted for, so what this other gland was, we had no idea. It was at this point in the procedure that Dave stated the gland was beating. I asked how that could be possible since the creature was clearly dead, but upon inspection myself, I too noticed it did appear to be beating, very slowly. I placed my hand softly upon the gland and felt it pulse. 
I noticed immediately a silvery, metallic-looking bodily fluid of some kind on my glove and that this gland appeared to be secreting. Not only did it appear to be still pumping this substance through the body somehow, it also secreted it into the cavernous spaces of the skull and down its spinal column. Using a syringe, I pierced the gland and was able to aspirate a significant amount of the fluid. It was a silvery liquid that looked similar to mercury but lacked the shine. It was a very dull silver in color. I placed it into a vial for further research. Was it its blood? I don't know. I don't believe it was simply because the next day we found out what it did. What was that? We spent all day theorizing over our findings. We spent the night in the lab and didn't call our families. We weren't due back for a few days anyway. We woke up the next morning to a shocking finding on the cadaver. The incision I had made in its chest was in an advanced state of healing. We didn't equate this substance to this healing until after we discussed how an incision so large as to open the entire front of the torso could possibly look this healed in a little over 18 hours. We deduced the mystery gland with this mysterious substance was the only thing still functioning on this cadaver somehow, despite its deceased status. We decided we needed to test this hypothesis. I, I could talk for days about our experiments, so I'm going to have to break it down to the most important parts. We decided to inject this substance into lab mice and see how they reacted. The first three mice we injected appeared to die, but they didn't actually perish. Clinically, they appeared dead, meaning the fluid was incompatible to the point of causing death in the subject, but after declaring them dead, they were found to be active again after a short time. Though they seemed almost rabid, they viciously attacked the other mouse in the pen and killed it immediately and appeared to begin to cannibalize its corpse. I want to take this time to interrupt the recording and say I have never heard anything this thought out, intricate, and scientific in my entire career. I am absolutely hooked at this time, and despite it being an appropriate time to break, I don't. We then attempted to terminate the rabid mice using an injectable toxin. We have euthanized many mice using this method, and this is the first time it did not have any effect of any kind on any of the mice. I then doubled the dose and injected them again. They should have been dead in less than a minute, but they remained as active as before. Dave took over at this point. He took the tongs we used to hold them in place and proceeded to pierce their skulls with the syringe. This method effectively resulted in their deaths. John then suggested we inject a few more mice but keep them all separate. I agreed and proceeded to inject three more mice with the fluid. It was at this time we decided to test our hypothesis that this substance was providing the cadaver a healing property despite it being dead by removing the gland. We extracted more of the silvery fluid since we feared removal of the gland would result in loss of the fluid production itself. After the gland was removed, a large incision was made to test our hypothesis. After nearly eight hours, the incision had not healed at all, thus proving our hypothesis. Whatever this fluid was, it had a tremendous healing effect on the ET's body. That must have been why there was no trauma on the body from the crash. It had been healed. We also theorized that this substance could not actually bring the E.T. back to life should it perish, as it appeared to have drowned and died. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Shortly after euthanizing the lab mice, we performed an autopsy on one of them. Though they had been dead only 15 minutes, its internal organs told a different story. Atrophy and shrinkage of the internal organs indicated the mice had been deceased for several hours. Knowing this could not possibly be, we examined its brain where a large concentration of silver fluid had accumulated. We had no explanation for this, and after lots of conjecture, we hypothesized that with the amount of this fluid located in the brain of this mouse, that it somehow retained its healing property and despite the apparent toxicity of this substance, it somehow kept the mouse's brain active, though on a very primitive level, while it caused the rest of the body to waste away as if it had expired. We felt this was an appropriate hypothesis, given the toxin we had used had no effect on the mouse, and only after we pierced its brain did it finally expire. We then did an autopsy on the other two mice, which produced identical results. What happened with the other set of mice? This is kind of the beginning of the end. Two of the mice proceeded exactly as the first three had. They appeared to die, only they did not, and became rabid immediately attempting to attack our fingers when we pressed them up to the glass. 
The third mouse, however, exhibited something else entirely. Long after the other two had gone rabid, this mouse appeared to be completely unaffected by the injection of this fluid. We knew we had to be very careful with this mouse and how we proceeded. As it was not exhibiting symptoms of toxicity from this fluid, we needed to ascertain whether or not this mouse's body had accepted the fluid and was now capable of regenerating from physical injury, or if it was simply carrying this fluid in its body. Carrying as in the medical sense with disease? Correct. This mouse could simply be immune to the toxicity or incompatibility and not be able to regenerate from injury. It just carries this fluid in its body. Unfortunately, John got ahead of himself. Seeing that the mouse appeared to be perfectly fine, he picked it up. It bit him hard enough to pierce his glove on his left thumb. He dropped the mouse and scampered away. Gary and Dave immediately tore the place apart looking for it, as did I while John began scrubbing and decontamination. We were not able to find it. We had lost our only successful specimen. We advised John to go to the hospital immediately, but he declined. It was his fault we lost the mouse, and he was determined to continue searching for it. We should have insisted harder than we did that he go. We never found the mouse. We spent most of that day in conjecture and hypothesizing our findings. By the evening, we were still going over our notes and making journal entries. At about 6.30 p.m., John had an uncontrollable coughing fit. He looked pale and diaphoretic, and we knew it was because of the mouse biting him. His thumb also looked disgusting. We were all biologists, we should have known to stop what we were doing and take him in right away, but we just couldn't peel ourselves away from what we were doing. Gary volunteered to take him to the local ER while Dave and I stayed behind. I never saw John again. While we were alone, Dave mentioned we needed to test the fluid on something other than a mouse. At this point, I realized we had all gone too far. We should have just left the crash site alone and certainly shouldn't have entered it. Dave was starting to become fanatical, bordering on unethical. He started to offer picking up a stray dog or cat, and when he mentioned a homeless person, it, it was at that point I knew we were all in serious trouble. I told him there was no way any of us could possibly partake in something so unethical. He reiterated the fact that somehow we needed a human test. Maybe it was just something with the mice. If a human host accepted this fluid, it could potentially be synthesized to create the most powerful healing agent known to man. Sickness and disease would be eradicated if it worked. I repeated to him, if it worked. We would be responsible for the death of a human being if it didn't. It would absolutely be murder. After a few minutes or so, I realized we did have a human test. John. I told Dave, just look at John. He's showing the same symptoms of decline the mice did. He then told me that that can't be considered a true test. The mouse couldn't possibly have passed on the mystery fluid through a small, simple bite. A full injection needed to occur. I began to realize with John's condition that this fluid appeared to be acting like a true disease, and then cause a rabid insanity in anyone who was compatible, we could be looking at a major outbreak. I felt like I needed to call the hospital to warn them. Did you? I didn't get the chance. Gary came back at that point and said John appeared to look even worse after only 20 minutes in the car. I informed him what I had talked to Dave about, and he immediately concurred we needed to stop what we were doing. We went back to the lounge room we have. We rented out several other small offices in addition to the area we were using for our lab, and found Dave was missing. Fearing the worst, we immediately went back to the lab and found him with the tourniquet on his left arm. He was injecting himself with the silver fluid. Gary asked him what he had done, and I had some choice questions myself, knowing he had just signed his own death certificate. I knew we needed to involve the police at this point. I was not optimistic that his body was going to accept the fluid as the mouses had. We discovered our options at this point. I reiterated my theory on how this fluid acted almost like a virus. All but one of the mice had succumbed to the incompatibility and eventually went insane. It was my theory that one of two things occurred in the mouse that did not. Either, for reasons unknown, the mouse accepted the fluid and was now a super mouse, or the mouse was simply acting as a carrier, meaning its body was unaffected by the fluid and it was simply carrying it. Either case would still be capable of transmission via bite. Gary was a virologist, and he mentioned one other thing. Some viruses cause mutation of the host genome. Nothing like you see in the movies where they turn into hulking monsters, but we had to consider two things. 
This wasn't actually a virus, it just appeared to act like one. And if this fluid did cause a mutation, there's no telling what that would mean. You shot him, so obviously he went bad, and I'm guessing you wouldn't have mentioned this mutation thing if that's not what happened. That's what happened. I guess we'll just skip to the main event. I could ramble on about theory and our scientific shenanigans all night. We didn't get much sleep that night on account of Dave. We drew some blood and did an analysis, and his blood was loaded with some sort of antigen. No doubt a product of the introduction of that fluid. It seemed like it was rewriting his genome somehow. By midnight, he was noticeably taller, as if his growth plate had been reopened by this antigen. This did not happen in the mice, so this was intriguing, but he was also declining visibly. He was pale, his color was leaving him, and he was diaphoretic. His decline was much slower than the mice and John as well. We'd virtually forgotten about John by that point. We had old hospital restraints in our equipment room. Dave said we should tie him down. He said he was starting to lose it, and he looked like hell, like death, and he was huge. His left hand was starting to contort and deform into this horrid claw. It was far too late to take him to the hospital at this point, so we knew we were screwed. We tied him down, claw and everything. Though I didn't think that was going to matter, it didn't. After that, Gary and I were so exhausted, we fell asleep like idiots. When I woke up, it was about 6.15 in the morning. I nudged Gary, telling him to wake up, and we checked on Dave. He was dead. I instantly got a tremendous feeling of dread. How long had he been dead? Was he actually dead? He could reanimate any second. Did he? Yes. Gary was examining the body, and he was way too close. I told him to back up, but it was too late. Dave reached over faster than I'd seen anyone ever move, and he had Gary by the throat. He snapped the restraints we had him in as if he was tied down with toilet paper. He then bit a huge chunk out of Gary's shoulder and then broke his neck. Pretty sure that was just on accident, though, on account of his new strength. I ran for it as he threw Gary away. Dave stood up, and he had to be about 6'5". He was 5'10 or so previously. I went to the lounge. We had a 45 hidden there, just in case there were nights we were there late. The docks can get rather shady characters at night. Anyway, it... I had the lights off, and I was hiding behind the desk. I could hear Dave's heavy footsteps outside. His respirations were like a chainsaw. I knew he was looking for me. The door to the lounge opened, and I heard heavy footsteps enter the room. I was shaking uncontrollably as I hear him stop. I ask myself, have his senses heightened? Can he hear me or even smell me? I hear a few more steps and suddenly the desk lifts up into the air like it weighs nothing and Dave's claw is holding it up with just one arm. His clothing was torn and tattered and his skin looked like it was rotting off. I don't know why, but for some reason, Dave just stopped moving, as if his mind was trying to regain control of his body. As he stood there holding the desk up, I simply crawled between his legs, out behind him, and ran for it. I heard the desk smash into the wall behind me like he'd thrown it. I made for the door outside, and then I realized something. I have to stop Dave, here and now. If he gets out, how many people is he going to kill and then infect? I went back towards our lab. I had seven shots. I would get as close as I could and put all seven in his head. Head trauma is what finally stopped the mice. I slowly entered the lab just in time to see Dave wind up and punch a hole through the wall, after which he stepped out into the sunlight and into the marina. I followed as fast I could. The early birds were all out on the docks in the marina, getting their boats ready, ripe for the picking. I hollered Dave as loud as I could as I ran up to him. He spun around with a growl that would make a lion jealous. This caught everyone's attention, of course, and they all turned to see me run up to him and put two in his face. He stumbled and swayed before falling. I then put three more in his head, and it pretty much exploded. The shrieks of bystanders filled the area as everyone scattered. Running on pure adrenaline and nearly insane myself, I ran back into the lab. Gary had been bit, and he needed one in his head too. As I got back into the lab, I saw Gary starting to stand up. He turned fast. I put two in his head as well. No sooner did I drop the gun in pure shock that I heard rushing footsteps behind me, followed by police yelling for me to get on the ground. And here we are. So, let me tell you why I think I believe him. I asked him about the crime scene and if anyone saw Dave as a creature and he had no idea. 
He had no idea what became of the lab and all their research either, nor did he know anything about John. He was very educated, but he also had street smarts. He told me at that point that any day now, once it came out what had happened, the government would be stepping in and he'd be black bagged. He was right. A couple days later, I was approached at the station by men in suits, FBI for sure. They told me my services were no longer required in this case, and I was to turn over all materials related to it. I turned over the tape, but I had already saved it elsewhere, so I wasn't so pissed about it. I asked the arresting officer and detectives assigned, and they told me they too had been reassigned, and that the case was being handled externally. I decided to do some investigating of my own. First thing I checked was their lab in one of the warehouses at the docks. This was at least a week after the event, and I could still see men in hazmat suits entering and exiting the warehouse, which seemed completely closed off, not just the areas they rented. I needed binoculars, since you could barely go anywhere down there without being stopped and redirected by men who were most certainly mercenaries. Next thing I checked was the hospital. I have a couple doctor friends. I asked the ER doc, and he said he'd never seen anything like it. They shipped him up the floor real quick. Luckily, the admitting doc on the floor was also a friend. He told me they put a gag order on him, so we met in person. No traceable, electronic conversation of any kind. He told me John died shortly after he was admitted. He said as soon as they bagged him up, John sat up and started thrashing and snarling and growling. They called security and then called the cops after the nurse's aide got bit trying to open the bag. They were able to zip the bag back up without anyone else getting bit. A security guard supposedly lost it when he saw John's dead body going crazy and biting a fellow employee, so he hit him with a portable oxygen tank over the head. Apparently enough trauma to kill John. Again. A few days later, the aide turned in her resignation via email and was never heard from again. He also told me John's chart was later deleted entirely. He told me you can't just delete a patient's electronic medical record. Whoever did it would have to be way high up. As for John's body, someone from the coroner's office came to get it, but my friend didn't recognize them, and he knew all the pickup guys. They also drove away in an unmarked van. City vehicles were all clearly marked. Lastly, I went to the campsite myself where they went. I used my GPS to find the lake they said they went to and took the back road to where they launched their boats. It was completely blocked off, and not only were there angry no trespassing signs up, but there was also one even saying intruders might be shot. I'm hoping it's been long enough that it's blown over and nobody is bothering with me anymore so I can tell this story. As for Michael, I never heard from him again either. I tried looking him up in the system and his file with the local department had been deleted as well. And police records are another thing you can't just delete entirely. All four of their social media has been deactivated and Google search only brings up people with similar names. It doesn't even bring up anything from the university. Michael was blackbacked for sure, as were the other three post-mortem. I don't know about you, but this has conspiracy written all over it, and the more I think about it, the more I actually think this all happened, exactly as Michael said. One other thing I can't help but think about was that mouse that got away. Is there a genetic super mouse somewhere down at the marina, or did those government whack jobs find it? If they didn't, we all better hope he lays low. It seems like major outbreaks throughout history always start with rodent carriers.